Um, the first thing we're going to do is, um, obviously, if this is Pints of Pastorines and our virtual things, we're going to do some sort of uh, ID trivia game. Um, this is just for fun. You don't have to use the chat or anything. If you're on Zoom or on Facebook, you can um, type in what bird you think this is. Um, when I get it all set up. Uh, all right, thumbs up if you can see that. All good. Awesome. Perfect. So of course it's cranes. So you we're doing cranes of the world. I only did, I think, six out of the 15. So no like craziness. I won't pull you through all of these. They're just for fun. If you guys know what they are, feel free to unmute yourselves and shout them out. Or if you're on Facebook, feel free to comment. Uh, so the first guy, start you off with hopefully one that you recognize. Um, I think someone has it in their background for the Zoom call. <laughs> Guesses. Margaret, yes, Margaret, guess that one. Plus two colts, nice work, Finn. Yes, the chicks are called colts for the sandhills. These are sandhill cranes. Very good. A lot of them are at uh, Jasper Pulaski right now and throughout Indiana. Here's one you may or may not recognize. Any guesses on what this one is? I'm just guessing common crane. Sophie, maybe I should ask you to announce them. Do you know which one this is? <laughs> I hope so. It's the hooded crane. <laughs> yes, it is the hooded crane. Good guess. Good guesses. All right, the next guy. Thought this one was cool, so. <laughs> Guessing crane species if you're just joining us on Facebook Live. Guesses, guesses. Red face crane. Very good guess. I like it intuition this is the siberian crane very cool next up hopefully one that you are also familiar with <laughs> everyone's very excited about this one <laughs> i'm glad <laughs> yes this is the whooping crane i believe sophie's gonna extensively talk about those <laughs> All right, we have two more about this guy. I feel like this one's very stealth looking. This is my favorite crane species. Ooh, my favorite is the next one. So it's like <laughs> <laughs> telepathy. Red crowned, somebody guessed. Sophie, which, which one is it? It is the red crowned. Nice work. Diana got that one. Red crown crane and the last one, my personal favorite. I believe it is the national bird of Tanzania. It's on their coins and money and things like that. Uganda as well. Oh, nice. It is, you are correct, Margaret, gray crowned crane. A little foof, even though I mean it's not really a gray crown. <laughs> Are there several subspecies of this one? Sophie, do you know the answer to that one? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think there are a few subspecies. Of, I'm not sure which ones that ICF recognizes, though. Um, I don't know if my colleague Lizzie has any other input on that. <laughs> Dealing with a dog right now. <laughs> Adorable dog. <laughs> um, you, yeah, I think that there are subspecies. I, I unfortunately don't know like which ones ICF recognizes. There are two species of crown cranes, though. That might be what you're thinking of, Finn. Um, there's a black crown crane and a gray crown crane. Um, and some zoos don't necessarily recognize that there are two different species. And so sometimes you'll see hybrids at zoos, or they'll just label it as an African crowned crane. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Questions already, which is great. So uh, welcome again to Pints and Pass Rings or Pints and Cranes. Um, tonight, we are lucky enough to have a few people from the International Crane Foundation here with us. 
Um, but the main one that we have speaking tonight is Sophie, is it Wolbert? Um, yes. She is the assistant or Whooping Crane Outreach Assistant in Indiana, correct? But you're currently down in Texas working remotely, right? That's correct. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I am going to turn it over to Sophie. And again, if anyone has any questions during, this is kind of um, informal, you can put them in the chat and I'll make sure that Sophie gets them. Or if you want to unmute yourself, there's a good stopping point, feel free. So thanks for joining us, Sophie. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sam. And if you see any questions, then I don't seem to stop. Just feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And I have a couple of crane trivia slides for you all as well. So let me get this going here. Okie dokie. So before we get started, let's just do some, some more crane trivia. So this is the blue crane, which is what country's national bird? Any guesses? No guesses. This is the national bird of South Africa. Um, I really like this species. They're pretty cool looking in my opinion. Alrighty, and then the next one, true or false, the red patch on cranes heads is made of red feathers. Maybe some of you all know this one. Let me open up the chat so I can see. Ooh, we got a false and a true. Let's see. The answer is false. It's just a bald patch of bare skin. And actually, cranes can enlarge it by sending more blood to it. And that happens when they're feeling aggressive or territorial. Let's see. How about the next one? How many of the 15 crane species are endangered? <clears throat> this may come up later on. So. Somebody guessed all crane species, seven, 10, 12, 14. The answer is 11 of the 15 crane species are threatened or endangered. <clears throat> and a couple more here. Uh, does anyone know which of these birds are closer relatives of cranes? On top we have the Virginia rail and on the bottom we have great egret. Which one is the closer relative? A couple of people are guessing the rail. You are correct. It is the Virginia rail. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And I think this is our final question. True or false? Some cranes can drink salt water. Any guesses on this one? True, true. False, false. The answer is true. This crane species in this picture is called the Brolga, which lives in Australia. And they have a salt gland, which um, is something that some other birds have. I think gulls also have salt glands and that allows them to drink salt water. So I thought that was pretty interesting to include. Alrighty, that was my last trivia question. Thank you for indulging me on that. Okay, so uh, thank you all so much for joining me tonight. My name is Sophie Wilbert. Like Sam said, I'm the Whooping Crane Outreach Program Assistant for Indiana, and I work for the International Crane Foundation. And I'm really excited to be here uh, talking about cranes, which are very much not passerines, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, but hopefully you don't mind this intrusion in your regular passerine themed programming. Um, so throughout this presentation, I'll be sharing all sorts of information about cranes. And like Sam said, you can jump in with questions if you want to. Um, you can use the chat. Uh, and we'll also have plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, and I also wanted to mention I'll be using some polls uh, throughout the presentation. So hopefully those will just pop up on your screen if you're on the Zoom. I don't know. I, I guess they probably won't uh, apply for those of you watching on Facebook. but. Um, just, real, so just really, just really quickly, Sophie. Um, yes. When, when you said that the feather, the red wasn't really feathers, but it was a bald patch. Somebody asked, "Is that true of all of them?" And then just now, when you showed the last one with red, it was rough, like it was feathers. And somebody typed into chat, "Why is that red patch textured?" So, is the red always bare skin, or is it sometimes feathers in some of the species? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I can go back to that slide. It does look kind of like it's uh, it's textured and is textured, but it is um, it's always a bald patch of skin. Um, and I think the texturing just comes from kind of little uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, but little uh, bumps or something, and it's just skin. Yeah, good question. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okie dokie. So let's get started here. Um, so I'm sure many of you are aware, probably because you're here, um, Indiana is really a great state for cranes, um, including the endangered whooping crane, which we see here. And many cranes spend at least part of the year here in Indiana. And so I'm very excited to speak to all of you because as members of Indiana Audubon, I know that you understand how special cranes are. And Indiana is really an important place for cranes. It's so important that my whole job is based on doing outreach like this program here in Indiana. Um, and that's also that we can help protect the beautiful cranes that are found here. So with that, I will launch my first poll. Let's see if I can get this going. Okie dokie. So my first question is, have you seen a crane before? So I'll give everyone a few seconds to vote on that poll. Oh, I can't vote as the co-host, boo. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> What would you have voted for, Sam? <laughs> I have, yes, seen a crane. I actually live right next to a uh, cornfield and I hear them in the evening. So, oh, lovely. I can yeah. see them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll wrap this up in just a second. Any last votes here before I end the poll? Okay, so the results are in. 96% of you have seen a crane, um, which is awesome. And let me see if I can. Uh, launch the next poll. Alrighty, this one's slightly different, but have you heard of the International Crane Foundation before? Give everyone a few seconds to vote on that. Alrighty, any last votes before I close? All right, and it looks like most of you have heard of the International Crane Foundation before, which is very exciting. And hopefully for those of you who haven't, by the end of this presentation, you'll have more of a sense of who we are and what we do. Um, so I'll end that poll and move on here. So I just wanted to share a little outline of my presentation tonight. So I'm gonna start with talking about the International Crane Foundation, and then I'll move into some information about cranes in general. And then I'll talk more specifically about the two Indiana crane species that we have. And then I will also share how you can help cranes in Indiana. And then, like I said, we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. So the International Crane Foundation has headquarters in Baraboo, Wisconsin, which is pretty close to the Wisconsin Dells area, in case some of you have heard of that. But we also have staff all around the world. We have offices in China and South Africa, as well as um, partner offices and regional offices in many other countries like Zambia, Uganda, Russia, Mongolia. Um, so we really work all around the world wherever there are cranes. And our mission is to work worldwide to conserve cranes and the ecosystems, watersheds, and flyways on which they depend. And we were founded in 1973 by these two gentlemen right here. We have Ron Sowie on the left and George Archibald on the right. And they met as doctoral students at Cornell University. And they realized that they both had a passion for saving the world's 15 crane species from extinction. So they founded ICF. And George and Ron were only in their 20s when they founded ICF, which is pretty incredible to me as someone who's also only in my 20s. Um, and they originally intended it to be a species bank for the world's crane species in case any of them went extinct in the wild. But over the last almost 50 years, ICF has grown into a global organization that not only protects the cranes of the world, but also the habitats and the communities where they live. And we are a nonprofit organization, but we do have a zoo um, at our site in Baraboo where we do host field trips and group tours and visitors from all around the world. 
And while we are a zoo, we're also very different from other zoos because um, if you've been to the Indianapolis Zoo or other zoos around the country, um, most zoos typically have one to two crane species, but ICF has all 15. And we're actually the only place in the whole world where you can see all 15 cranes at once. So that is pretty exciting. And I mentioned this earlier on, but we did just con complete a big renovation project on our site in Baraboo. Um, here in this picture is our brand new welcome center that we're very excited about. Um, and we are hoping to reopen next May in 2021, um, but obviously it does depend on the evolving pandemic situation. So you can check out our website to stay updated on that. Alrighty, let's dive into some information about cranes. So what is a crane? Uh, as many of you know, cranes are large birds with long legs and long necks and long beaks. They're, they range from a, about three feet to six feet tall. The tallest crane is called the Saurus crane and that lives in parts of India and other um, Asian countries. And they're found almost everywhere on earth. Um, the only two continents that don't have cranes are South America and Antarctica. And on the whole, cranes are very dependent upon large uninterrupted wetlands. Um, and you can see in these photos, we have the gray crowned crane on the left, which was Sam's favorite. And then the blue crane down in the middle here, and then the Eurasian crane, which is also called the common crane. And so cranes look pretty similar to herons and egrets, but there are some differences that can help us tell them apart. One of these is when they're flying, um, herons and egrets will fly with a little kink in their neck that looks kind of like an S shape, as you can see with the great egret there on the left. And then um, you can see the sandhill crane when it's flying, and this applies to all cranes, they fly with their necks outstretched. So if you see a big bird flying with a long neck outstretched and long legs trailing behind, um, it's likely a crane. But other than this neck difference, cranes look a lot like herons and egrets. Um, but as we learned in the trivia question, they're actually not close relatives. Herons and egrets are in the same family as pelicans, um, and they're actually more closely related to seabirds like gulls and penguins than they are to cranes. Um, so all the, the, similar, the similarities in their appearance is due to convergent evolution. Um, they both evolved to live in wetland habitats. And Crane's closest relatives are coots and rails, as we learned in the trivia. And so here we see a waddled crane on the left and a Virginia rail on the right. So despite how different they look, they're actually close relatives. So there are a few things that unite all cranes. Um, one of them is what they eat. Cranes are omnivores, so they'll pretty much eat anything they can find in their environment. Here we have a whooping crane eating a blue crab down in Texas. Um, but they'll also eat small mammals, plant tubers, amphibians, reptiles, insects, other crustaceans, and grains such as corn. They'll really uh, eat whatever they can get their beaks on. Um, I think we have a couple things going on in the chat. Let me just pause and take a look. Alrighty. The, that little blue one reminds me of an awful fancy blue faced snow goose. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and then are cranes related to limpkins? Um, I, I believe so. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that. That's a good question. Alrighty. So another thing that unites all cranes is this very famous behavior that we have a pair of gray crowned cranes doing in this photo. Um, it's one of the most well-known facts about cranes and one of the things that endears them to people and it's that they dance. All crane species dance as part of their courtship and mating behavior. And it's very, very cool to watch if you've ever seen it happening. Um, and so cranes mate for life and dancing actually helps them find a mate and it helps to reinforce the bonds between already mated pairs. So here we have some red crown cranes dancing in the snow in Japan. It's very beautiful. And they do have several common dance moves as we sometimes call them. And these can include jumping in the air and bowing to each other and bobbing their heads and even throwing sticks into the air, like you see the sandhill crane in this picture doing. And this photo is actually from uh, Miskatatuck National Wildlife Refuge, which is in Southern Indiana. And another key behavior of cranes is their migration. 
Um, many cranes travel thousands of miles every year between their wintering and breeding grounds. And I'm sure, uh, as Sam sort of mentioned earlier, I'm sure many of you know about this happening right now at places like Jasper Pulaski. Um, and I will go into that a little bit more soon. Um, so I have a couple of fun facts about crane migrations. Uh, the sandhill cranes in the mid-continent population here in North America have the longest migration of any crane species. Um, they fly between northeastern Siberia, down through Alaska, Canada, and the US into northern Mexico. Um, so this is obviously thousands of miles and quite a long journey, and that is the longest crane migration. And then another interesting crane migration uh, tidbit is has to do with this species, which is the demoiselle crane. Um, they're actually the smallest crane species. They're about three feet tall and they migrate over the Himalayan mountains. So that means they're crossing the mountain range at an altitude of up to 26,000 feet. So that's pretty dang high and um, that they do that to reach their wintering grounds in India. And this migration is actually featured on BBC's documentary Planet Earth. So if any of you have watched the mountains episode of that, um, you can see a, a pretty dramatic scene with a golden eagle attacking a demoiselle crane during this migration. So as we've mentioned before, there are 15 species of cranes in the world, and we have two of them in North America. Um, I'm hoping someone in the chat can tell me which two species we have in North America. Let me open that back up. The ID game should have helped, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. OK, we've got a couple of people. Sandhill and Whooping, that is correct. Yes, and I'm seeing a question, um, what do sandhills eat in the cornfields? That's a good question. Uh, they typically eat waste grain, so the, the stuff that's left over after the harvest. Um, so yes, that is what, and they, they'll also eat insects as well um, in, the, in the fields. So that's another good question. So yes, we do have sandhills and whooping cranes here in North America. And so I'm going to start with the sandhill crane. So, um, just some information about what they look like. We already did some practice IDing them in the trivia, but uh, you can see that they're kind of a dusty gray color. Sometimes they look a little bit more brown. Um, they have long legs, neck and beak, just like other cranes. And then they have white on their face, a little cheek patch of white, and then their red skin patch on their head. And I mentioned that sometimes they look a little bit more brown. And this is actually, it's not related to pigmentation or anything in their feathers. This is a behavior um, that has uh, helped sandhill cranes camouflage. So they'll actually paint their feathers with mud or clay from the ground. Um, so that's pretty interesting and that helps them camouflage in their wetland habitats. But we know that sandhill cranes are typically less dependent upon wetlands than most other crane species. They do still rely on wetlands for breeding, but they can find food in a variety of habitats, um, like we were talking about with the, the farm fields. Um, they'll often forage and hang out in urban areas, like in this picture, they're in someone's backyard. Um, you might have seen them wandering around your own neighborhoods or even in more rural areas, like farm fields, as we were talking about. And I'm sure many of you know, to, know this already, but sandhill cranes do gather by the thousands in various areas that we call stopover sites during their migration. And this is happening right now. Um, we're towards the tail end of the sandhill crane migration here. Um, and we do have a few of these sites in Indiana. Most notably, oopsie, most notably is Jasper Pulaski, which is in the northwestern part of the state. And on November 24th, so I think that was last Tuesday, the count from the Indiana DNR was 25,000. Um, and uh, according to their records that they have on their website, that is the highest number that Jasper Pulaski has seen in the last two years. So that's pretty incredible. It looks a little something like this. And for those of you who have been to Jasper Pulaski, you know there's a really nice viewing platform there so that you can uh, take a look at all these cranes as they're landing and flying around in the wetland. And another thing about sandhill cranes is that they are the most abundant crane species. Uh, the current uh, population estimate is 820,000. Um, so they, they're the most abundant crane species and they're, uh, they're really quite abundant. And so here is a picture from the Platte River in Nebraska, which is another really popular stopover site during their migration. So you can see them by the tens of thousands here, which is really cool. 
going to take a quick peek at the chat again. Oh, Joy said that you saw a record of 30,000 recently. That's great. That's very cool. And some people have seen whooping cranes too. Um, so that's really awesome. Okie dokie. So let's bring it back to our 15 species. Uh, we know that sandhills are the most abundant, but we also know that on the whole, cranes are an endangered family of birds. Um, so I did have another poll question, but I forgot that I already covered this in trivia, so we know the answer. How many of the 15 crane species are listed as threatened or endangered? I'm not going to launch the poll since we already did that, but 11 of the 15 species are listed as either threatened or endangered. And our friend, the whooping crane, is one of them. So now I'm going to transition into talking more about whooping cranes and the amazing story that brought them back from the brink of extinction. But before I get into that, I did want to ask this poll question here. Let me launch that real quick. Okie dokie. So I want to know, have you seen a whooping crane in Indiana? I'll give everyone a few seconds to answer that one. Some more people in the chat chiming in about the large sand hill counts that they've seen. That's awesome. Alrighty. A couple more seconds before I close this. Any last votes? Okay, let me share those results. Okay, so we've got maybe about half of you have seen them in the wild and otherwise uh, some of you haven't seen one at all. Some of you have seen them somewhere else. So that is just fine. Um, I'm very excited for those of you who have seen whooping cranes. So as many of you know, uh, there are several key features about whooping cranes um, that help you identify them. Um, let me move to my next slide here. Okay. So uh, a lot of people do get mixed up between whooping cranes and sandhill cranes because they're both found here in Indiana. Um, but there are key features that we can use to tell them apart. So uh, whooping cranes, in contrast to sandhill cranes, are this bright white color, and they also have black wingtips, which can help you tell them apart while they're flying. Um, whooping cranes also have a slightly different face than sandhill cranes. They have kind of a black mustache, um, as opposed to the cheek patch that sandhills have, and then they do have a, a red patch on their head as well. Um, and then another really big difference between whooping cranes and sandhills is that the whooping crane is five feet tall, whereas sandhill cranes are around four feet tall. So size can be a helpful indicator. Um, if you happen to see them flying like this, you could tell from the size, but usually that's not the most helpful um, thing to tell them apart. So you can look at their colors as well. And another key difference between whooping cranes and sandhill cranes is that whooping cranes are endangered. And we already know that sandhills are not endangered. They're the most abundant crane species. Um, so I said that there are about 800,000 sandhills, uh, but there are only about 800 whooping cranes in the world, and around 150 of those are in captivity. And while 800 is really not that many for an entire species, whooping cranes have recovered from fewer than 30 individuals in the 1940s. Hey, Sophie. Before yes. you get too far, we had a question about um, when you first, your whooping crane, the first slide you had, Finn's wondering if you know why the bird doesn't have the colored bands. Ah. Or, or is that one colored or do you know anything about that one? Um, I'm not sure about this specific photo, but um, I, it's possible that this was a crane from the, um, the Aransas wood buffalo migratory population, which I'll mention in just a bit. Um, but there are several different populations. Sorry? This one, this one was taken at ICF. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, so this bird looks like it's in the wild, but it's actually in one of our exhibits. Um, and we don't put color bands on them in captivity. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lizzie. Makes sense. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I can talk more about the bands in a little bit. Um, so that'll make more sense later on. Um, so yeah, here are those population numbers again. We've got 826 total whooping cranes in the world. Um, and like I said, that's really not that many for a whole species, but we know that they've undergone a significant recovery in the last 70 years from fewer than 30 birds. And it's really taken quite a lot of effort 
Um, but it's been a successful effort for the most part. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about this uh, conservation success story now. Oops. So how did we get to that all-time low of only 30 whooping cranes in the 1940s? One factor was unregulated hunting. Um, and then another one was egg collection. And both of these were done um, for something called the millinery trade, which is uh, shown in this picture. It was the, the trend of um, fancy ladies wearing hats with parts of birds, feathers, even entire birds, like in this picture. Um, and this was really devastating to a lot of bird species. And as you can imagine, whooping cranes with their beautiful white feathers, um, they were quite uh, popular for these hats. So that was one of the many factors that led to their decline. And then of course, habitat loss was also a huge factor as people started moving west in, um, in the United States, uh, much of the wetland habitat that the whooping cranes relied on was devastated. And this is a disturbing picture, so I'm not gonna sit on it too long, but I do just want to give a little disclaimer about hunters. Um, so the unregulated hunting that led to the decline of the whooping crane is very different from modern day hunting. Um, we know that modern day hunters are, uh, they follow rules that are set in stone by our governments and, um, and they really are not the problem here. They're knowledgeable about animals and they're some of our biggest conservation allies. And so here in this picture, we have a very famous conservationist named Aldo Leopold, who's also a Wisconsin native. Um, and he was a hunter and much of his wildlife observation skills and the land ethic that he was so famous for came from his experiences hunting. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we clarify that, uh, that about hunters. So I want to also draw your attention to this number here. The Aransas wood buffalo migratory population is the last natural self-sustaining population of whooping cranes. And they are found, um, they, they breed in the wood buffalo national park in Canada, and then they um, migrate down to their wintering area in the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge on the Gulf Coast of Texas. And um, in the 1940s, this population was all that we had left. So all of those birds, the 30 birds that we had, um, they were all part of this population. So how do you begin to recover a whole species from just one population with such a low number? So one of the ways that we've done this is with a captive breeding program. And our goal with the captive breeding program is to reintroduce whooping cranes and ultimately establish another migratory population. So the captive breeding program is incredibly important for a species like whooping cranes because they have a very low reproductive rate. Uh, this has to do with a lot of things, um, namely there, it takes them a long time to reach sexual maturity. It takes about four to six years for whooping cranes to be able to reproduce. And they also only raise one chick to fledging. Um, there, there are sometimes cases where they'll be able to raise two, but typically it's just one chick. So that low reproductive rate means that a captive breeding program would really aid them um, in getting more chicks into the population. And so as we were uh, experimenting with this captive breeding program over the years, uh, we were very good at raising chicks in captivity, but we did learn some lessons. And the primary lesson is that you can't let humans raise crane chicks. And I want to know if anyone can tell me in the chat, why can't humans raise crane chicks? Any ideas about that? Yes, somebody said imprinting. That is exactly right. So uh, many birds do this. Um, but imprinting is when a newly hatched chick recognizes the first moving object that it sees and it learns to identify with that object. So for chicks that were being cared for by human scientists, they imprinted on humans and they thought that they were humans themselves. And obviously this is a really big problem when it comes time for, uh, for mating because the cranes didn't want to mate with each other. They didn't even know that they were cranes. So we had to figure out ways to avoid this problem. And over the years, we've developed two main methods for raising chicks in captivity, and these chicks are later to be released into the wild. So the first method that I'll talk about is called parent rearing. 
So we use adult whooping crane pairs in our captive breeding program to produce and raise chicks. And uh, these parent reared chicks will be released when they're old enough to fly. And this method is the, our preferred method because it really mimics how a wild hatched chick would be raised by its parents. But it does rely on having enough captive parent birds to, to raise the chicks. So um, that is a limiting factor. And our other method that we use to raise chicks is called costume rearing. And uh, this took a lot of time to develop with lots of trial and error, but um, we have humans that are wearing these crane costumes, like in this photo, um, and they will be, they're covering their human form. Um, they also have an MP3 player in their pocket that plays um, crane brooding calls and, and contact calls and they are trying to act as crane-like as possible. And so they'll, um, they'll teach the chicks how to find food and um, they'll even feed them for the first few weeks. And so this is our other method of raising whooping crane chicks. And so using these costumes, we were able to teach the cranes almost all the skills that they need to survive in the wild. But remember our goal was to reintroduce a population of migratory cranes. And so uh, these humans in these costumes aren't able to teach the cranes to migrate. So, um, oops, sorry. Um, so we had to get creative, and this was this was a challenge that we had to overcome. And so the way that we were able to do this was with something called Operation Migration. So to teach these reintroduced juvenile cranes um, that had been raised in captivity to migrate, we used ultralight aircrafts like the one in this photo. Um, and they would actually lead the cranes on their first migration journey from Wisconsin to Florida. And then after being led there once, the cranes actually remember the migration route. And so then they can find their way back to Wisconsin in the spring. And this project uh, was called Operation Migration and it began in 2001 and it lasted until 2016. And today we actually release our captive reared chicks next to adult cranes. And then the adult cranes will lead the juveniles on their first migration. So because of this, the ultralight aircraft are no longer needed. And so we really consider this project to have been a huge success. And so from our last monthly report, the current population size for the Eastern migratory population is 80 birds. Um, this number is a little outdated here, but here again are all of those population numbers. And I want to check the chat and see, I might have missed a couple questions here. Um, <clears throat> I see somebody asked, is it true that if cranes have two chicks, they will kick out the second one to only raise one successfully? Um, I am not aware of that being the case. Um, I think if they're able to raise two chicks, then they will. And if not, um, the uh, the, the second egg is usually just a kind of backup egg in case the first one isn't successful. Um, what else? Let's see. Oh, Lizzie already answered that. Thank you, Lizzie. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. So um, here again are the, the ranges of whooping cranes. Um, so we have the Ransas wood buffalo population on the left, and then we have the eastern migratory population on the right, this air on the right, and then of course we have Indiana in this red circle. Uh, Sophie, someone, Margaret wants to know if the uh, eastern population is increasing or decreasing? Mm. Um, at the moment, it's, it's a little hard to tell. Uh, it has decreased over the last few years and we're having uh, trouble based on um, several different reasons and some unknown reasons um, with raising chicks and um, and so uh, it's a little hard to know. I'm hopeful that it'll be increasing soon but I'm not totally sure about that. <laughs> uh, and just kind of a sort of piggyback question. Uh, John wants to know with a relatively small gene pool is the likelihood of genetic defects high that's a good question. And that's actually one of the things that our captive breeding program really works on. Um, they have a very specific plan with all of the, the captive parent birds um, and our artificial insemination processes. Um, and that is all to kind of prevent this uh, genetic um, mixing issue. And so um, hopefully there won't be too much inbreeding, but that is always a concern. And so again, that's, that's a reason to have more than one population in case um, some disease were to 
affect an entire population, that would be pretty bad. So good questions, everybody. All right, so here in Indiana, we have four main sites where you can see whooping cranes. Um, the most popular one is Goose Pond Fish and Wildlife Area. Um, and then we also have Jasper Pulaski Fish and Wildlife Area, as well as Patoka and Muscatatuck National Wildlife Refuges. Um, and so some of the whooping cranes in Indiana will spend the whole winter here, but some move between Indiana and Alabama. Some only use Indiana as a stopover site on their way further south. Um, but over the winter of 2019 to 2020, there were about 50 individual birds documented in Indiana. So that's about half the, well, it's over half the population. Um, so whooping cranes really do love Indiana. And as of yesterday, there are 35 whooping cranes in Indiana. And I think uh, some of these are on their way south, but some might stick around for a while. Uh, this photo is actually from a cranberry farm in Adams County from last summer. Um, but hopefully, since there are so many whooping cranes in Indiana right now, maybe some of you all can get out and see them. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, this project that the Indiana Department of Natural Resources has done along with Purdue University. Um, Purdue has been doing so social science research around endangered species and they've designed um, several outreach campaigns um, which have been funded by the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Um, and so we have one of these with our Hoosiers for Whoopers campaign, which um, maybe some of you have heard of. And we're just basically trying to foster stewardship um, and education around whooping cranes in Indiana. Um, and so this leads me into how can you help whooping cranes in Indiana? And I'm gonna just check on the chat again here. Okay. Sorry, Sophie, I've been trying to answer questions as they come up. Uh, thank you, Lizzie, I appreciate that. Oh, I misspoke earlier. Yes, the Adams County is in Wisconsin. I'm talking about Indiana so much. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so how can you help whooping cranes in Indiana? The first step is you can learn to identify whooping cranes. So this is a identification guide that we have produced um, that shows whooping cranes along with sandhills and several other common water bird species that you might see. Um, so learning to identify whooping cranes is one way that you can help them. And then once you know how to identify them, you can actually report your sightings on our website at this address here. And um, this brings me into talking about the colored bands that we mentioned earlier. So uh, almost all of the whooping cranes in the eastern migratory population have these leg bands, which we use to identify individual birds. Um, and so the, each, each bird will have a different order of colors um, and different colors and which legs they're on and everything. So if you're able to take note of those colored bands and the placement um, of them, then that will really help our scientists when we are taking data about them. And of course, it's important to remember that uh, you have to keep your distance from wild whooping cranes. We recommend staying at least 200 yards, which is the equivalent of two football fields. Um, so at least 200 yards away from the wild whooping cranes. And this is why we have binoculars, right? So we can see them from far away. So um, they are actually, they have several threat behaviors that they might do if you're getting too close. Um, they also use these on other cranes and on predators, but um, if you see a crane showing you its red head, um, we know that in nature, the red is typically used as a stop sign. So um, that means that's a good indication you're too close. Another uh, indicator might be if you see a crane that looks really alert or if it's staring at you. Um, basically, if, if it's looking at you, then that means you're interrupting its natural behavior and you are probably too close. <clears throat> and then uh, on the left here, we have a whooping crane making itself look very big by spreading its wings out. Um, so that's another indicator that is a threat behavior um, that might mean that you're too close to the birds. So just remember to stay far enough away. <clears throat> I'll take some water real quick. <clears throat> All right, and uh, sometimes unfortunately we do have people that harass and disturb and poach even whooping cranes. And so if you observe this type of behavior, you can call the Indiana Department of Natural Resources at this number here. Um, but if you're in a nature preserve like Goose Pond or Jasper Pulaski, it might be more effective to call the preserve office so that a warden can deal with that situation. Um, that's what they're there for. So 
uh, yeah, you might not want to confront the individual yourself, so you can just let the nature office officer handle it. Um, and then if you're able to note any relevant information, like a license plate number or something like that, um, that could be helpful in your report. And we also need your help to spread the word about respecting private property. So we've actually heard from several landowners around Goose Pond specifically that people have been coming to their properties to see the whooping cranes. And in doing so, these people are actually trespassing. So I know that none of you would, would trespass to see whooping cranes, but uh, apparently there are rumors about birders being exempt from trespassing rules. So we need your help to stop the spread of these rumors. If you hear people talking about how, oh, so-and-so landowner said that we can go on their property and see the whooping cranes, um, there are currently no landowners in Indiana who allow birders on their property to view whooping cranes. Uh, so if you can stamp out these rumors, if you hear them, that would be very helpful for us. And you can just ask people to stick to viewing whooping cranes on public land like at Goose Pond. And once you have taken all of these steps, you can pledge to be a crane hero. Um, and so you can actually go to savingcranes.org slash Indiana slash pledge, and you can take our pledge to be a crane hero. And so part of our efforts in collaboration with Purdue was supposed to be distributing materials like this. Um, this is actually a placemat um, to communities in Indiana that have whooping cranes. But unfortunately, we had to stop this distribution because of COVID, um, but we're trying to get back into it. And we actually have uh, thousands of materials just sitting on campus at Purdue waiting to be picked up for distribution. So if you would like to help us with distributing these materials, um, I can give you more information. If you just wanna shoot me an email at swolbert at savingcranes.org, um, you are welcome to to email me and I can help you help us distribute some of these materials. We'd really appreciate that. And another way to help whooping cranes in Indiana is just by sharing knowledge about them with your friends and families and neighbors because we know that the more people who know about these special birds, the more people will want to protect them. So I have one final poll question for you all. Let me launch that real quick. I want to know what should you do if you see a whooping crane in the wild? I'll give you a few seconds to answer this one. I'll wait a few more seconds. Alrighty, I will end it there. Most of you got it right. Well, all of you got it right. Um, you should report your sighting on our website. You should stay at least 200 yards away and you should uh, tell a friend how amazing it was to see a wild whooping crane. All of the above are correct. Alrighty. And uh, the final thing, and probably one of the most important ways that you can support whooping cranes and the work that ICF does is by becoming a member or making a donation. Um, as a nonprofit, we really rely on support from community members like you. And you can also specify in the notes of your donation, if you want, that it should go to whooping crane outreach. Um, that will enable us to continue giving programs like this one. So if you enjoyed this program, please consider making a donation or becoming a member. And you can do that at this link here, savingcranes.org slash support. And thank you in advance. And I also wanted to thank the Affronts and Family Fund um, for sponsoring uh, the outreach work that we do here in Indiana. And then of course, uh, thank you so much to Indiana Audubon and Sam for hosting this program. And once again, thank all of you. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to do this and I've had a lot of fun so far. I hope to hear any of your questions that you have um, and hopefully all of us give a whoop now. <laughs> I certainly give a whoop. So thank you so much. I will stop sharing now. Awesome, thank you so much Sophie. Uh, where can we, when are you going to make those I give a whoop as like stickers or something? Because I would like to order those. <laughs> yes, we actually have plenty of those stickers. So um, I would be happy to send you some, Sam, and then you could get those out to your members if you want. That would be awesome. That is hilarious. I like it. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. We'll kind of hang around and see uh, if anyone has any questions. Feel free to type in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, any questions about cranes, whooping cranes, sand hills, others? They have for Sophie. I know that Lizzie answered a few of the questions in the chat already, um, just so the people on Facebook Live can hear them. Um, someone asked how long wild parents stay with their chicks. Um, and usually they part with them at some point during their first winter together, Lizzie said. Um, someone else asks if there are predators to cranes other than humans. Um, for chicks and colts, it could be many different predators, raccoons, coyotes, bobcats. Um, adults are pretty safe unless they're sick or injured. So thank you very much for answering those. Um, yeah. I see a couple of them that have just popped up in the chat. Perfect, you can see them, awesome. I will yeah. let you answer them then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, one, do all 15 species of cranes have similar calls? Um, they are pretty similar as bird calls go, but uh, they, they do have some distinct elements. Um, whooping cranes are obviously known for their resounding whoop call. Um, and then sandhill cranes, sometimes people call it like a karoo or kar, that kind of thing. Um, if you've heard it, I'm sure you know, um, but a lot of the cranes do kind of sound similar to that. So that's a good question. And then somebody else asked, is there something unique about the Jasper Pulaski site that attracts the sandhills? I first saw sandhills there back in the early 70s. So Jasper Pulaski is a really great habitat for sandhill cranes because it's sort of a mixture of wetlands and agricultural land. So there's a lot of good um, good habitat for roosting because uh, cranes, when they're sleeping, they'll sleep in um, in the middle of some water so that they can be alerted to any uh, predators approaching with the, the splashing of the water. Um, so with the wetlands, that's really helpful for them for roosting and then agricultural fields will provide um, good foraging locations for them as well. So that is what makes Jasper Pulaski such a good place for them. And then the next one, I saw a post on Facebook that claimed cranes stab pumpkins in the field and ruin the crop. Is this true? And if so, are there crane safe mitigation techniques? Um, I'm not so sure about pumpkins, but um, I do know that uh, the International Crane Foundation has been working over the last several years to develop um, a substance called Avapel, which is uh, it's a natural pesticide that, um, or not pesticide, it's, it's a, a thing that you can put on your crops to prevent cranes from, um, from eating them. And then the cranes will instead just uh, feed on the insects and the waste grain, which is actually helpful. For, for the crops. So um, you can find more information about that on our website if you want. Um, and then somebody else asked, do they social dance with each other after finding a mate or just to find a mate? Um, so cranes will dance with each other after they found mates. Um, it's kind of a way of strengthening the bonds between pairs in addition to uh, courtship behavior. Great questions, everybody. Uh, we have a question from Facebook. Uh, Darlene wants to know, why do they toss the dirt and pieces of stalks into the air? <laughs> um, it's just part of their, their dancing. Um, I'm not exactly sure why they do it. Uh, probably just a flashy behavior to get the attention of the other crane. Um, but it's, it's very cute and very endearing. So. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, just random question. I know we heard Sophie's favorite crane and mine, but Lizzie, do you have a favorite crane of yours? <laughs> yeah, if I can figure out how to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I think it's the red crown crane. Um, I was lucky enough, I got to see them in Japan a few years ago. Actually, like, right around this time of year, I've been getting reminders on my Google Photos mm. saying, remember what you did three years ago. It's making me very sad that we're still in a pandemic. Um, but yeah, I got to see them on Hokkaido, the northernmost island of Japan, and it was absolutely magical. Um, and I was hoping that I could see cranes dancing in South Africa this year um, that got canceled, but hope that I can go maybe next year or the year after. So cranes are still dancing all over the world. They probably don't know a pandemic is happening. I hope I can see them soon. 
Thanks, Lizzie. Um, I'm seeing a couple more questions popping up here in the chat. Uh, let's see. Do you have an estimation of how long Jasper Pulaski has had sand hills gathering there? That area was once part of the Grand Kankakee Marsh. Um, I don't know a ton about the history of Sandhills Gathering at Jasper Pulaski. Um, maybe Lizzie would know more about that. Um, yeah, I think it's been, you know, this is one of the oldest extant species that's around, um, and that's a very old flyway. Um, yeah, I do think that they were there when the, the Grand Kikiki Marsh existed. Um, and somebody earlier asked, why do they like JP so much? Um, and actually Sophie's editing a video uh, that covers that question that sh should come out in the next couple of days. Um, but uh, one reason why we think is because there's a great wetland there uh, where they can roost and um, they do like the agricultural fields that surround it. So it has a really nice mix of these two types of habitat that they need. Um, and um, also probably just kind of cultural tradition that's been passed down through generations of sandhill cranes. Um, they, they learn the migration from their parents and um, they've all figured out that JP is a great place to stop. Thank you, Lizzie. Mm -hmm. um, and then it looks like we've got a couple more questions. So uh, someone has seen flocks of sandhill cranes and whooping cranes among them. Um, I had some photos of those in my presentation as well. And they're asking, do whoopers migrate with cranes or just hang out with them when they come through? Um, so whooping cranes have been known to migrate with sandhill cranes. Um, sandhills usually migrate in very large groups and whooping cranes don't always do that. They sometimes just are in small family groups, maybe two or three cranes at a time, but they, they do sometimes spend time with sandhill cranes like a Jasper Pulaski and Goose Pond. And then are the non-migratory populations intentional or relics from before you learned how to train them to migrate? Are they hoping to grow or naturally die off? That's a good question. So um, on one of my slides, I had a, a, a graphic that had all the populations of cranes and the numbers. Um, so all of the non-migratory populations, the Florida one and the Louisiana one, are intentional. They are reintroduced populations um, and they were efforts that have um, have sort of petered out over the last several decades, um, but we do obviously hope that they grow. We would love to have as many populations of whooping cranes as possible. Yeah, we're still actively contributing to Louisiana. Um, so we still release birds into Louisiana. That program started in 2011. Um, there's only about nine birds left in Florida, and that's basically a failed reintroduction effort. Um, we've actually been moving some birds that are still remaining in Florida that are getting quite old. Um, we are moving them over to Louisiana as, as it is possible for us to do that. Thank you, Lizzie. Good question. And does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to un unmute yourself and jump in. I have a question. I, I, um, how long do the whooping cranes, like you mentioned, there were some old ones, that, you know, ones that are getting old in Florida. How long is their expected lifespan in the wild? Yeah, that's a good and, question. And same for sandhills. I don't know if it's any different between the sandhills and whoopers. Yeah, I actually don't know uh, about sandhills, but whooping cranes typically live uh, between 20 and 30 years in the wild, and they can live longer in captivity. Lizzie, do you know about sandhill cranes? Is it the same? Yeah, I think generally we say it's kind of the same for all crane species across the board. Uh, 20 to 30 years in the wild would be about normal. Uh, I'm sure that there's some variation that I, I don't know of, but yeah. Thank you. All right, anyone else have any questions for Sophie or Lizzie? Um, we'll give people a few last seconds on Facebook Live, but in the meantime, I just wanted to thank you, Sophie, so much. That was an awesome presentation. We got tons of comments um, in the chat and on Facebook Live as well. We really appreciate you joining us and uh, teaching about us about cranes. And Lizzie, thank you for joining as well and helping out with the questions. So it's always great to know, and if anyone has any other questions for them or anything like that you think of later, feel free to send me an email and I can forward them on to Sophie and Lizzie to get them answered. So 
just want to say thank you so much again and we appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sam. This has been so awesome and thank you all for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Oh, looks like we might have another question. Regarding migration, sand hills seem to take their time going south, but rapidly move north in the spring. Hmm, that is interesting. Maybe more of an observation than a question. <laughs> um, I didn't read it fully before I started talking. <laughs> yeah, I think we see that with a lot of uh, migratory bird species, that fall migration tends to be more of a long process and spring migration happens quickly. And I think it's because, um, especially the males, are uh, in a hurry to establish territories. Um, and so sometimes the females take a little longer, but in a species like whooping cranes, they typically go together. The male and female spend all year round together. And so they're rushing to get back and establish their territories in Wisconsin. Thank you, Lizzie. I'm seeing some more talk about the stickers in the chat. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> they want the stickers. <laughs> like I said, we used to give away prizes for some of our ID, so I will definitely uh, have to email you about getting some stickers and getting those out and hopefully uh, we're at events or sending them to people as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. Awesome. Well, if there aren't any more questions, we will uh, let you guys go. Thank you so much for everyone that joined. We appreciate it and look for a uh, future pints and pass rains probably after the holiday. So <laughs> Thank thanks you so again, much, everybody. guys. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. You too. Bye, everybody. <laughs>